Because speaking of very small dinosaurs, we're about to have a live falconry exhibit. As a lot of us know, birds are the modern descendants of very small dinosaurs that survived the 65 million year ago extinction. So Richard, Brian and Marie are going to show us some live birds and we're going to move this whole exhibit into the compass room, that's correct? Yeah, and so after the bird exhibit we're going to come back here at 1.30 and we're going to hear about the life of Charles Darwin from our next speaker. You actually would want to use that with the bird? No. <laughs> as long as it's not me. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Brian, I'm Richard's son, and uh, I've been a falconer off and on for about 20 years. And uh, over here is Marie Crawford. Uh, how long have you been a falconer, Marie? 15. 15 years, yeah, we're both uh, master falconers here in the state of Nevada. Uh, this is a peregrine falcon. I'll, uh, I'll take her hood off here in a second, but it's a uh, it's a falconry show, so I wanted to show you some of the gear. Um, that's an American Kessel right there. And uh, that is a red-tailed hawk on the end. Um, all three are considered indigenous to Nevada. Um, these two, the red tail and the kestrel, are pretty much everywhere. And um, we're getting more and more peregrines every year around the Reno area, but there's, you're still pretty lucky if you spot one. So, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, uh, these guys are pretty much a prime example of evolution. Um, what was your name again? Ben. Ben. Like Ben was saying, they're, uh, you know, they're pretty much modern dinosaurs. You know, the uh, scales turned into feathers. They've still got some pretty wicked looking feet on them, and uh, they're just specialized to catch a certain type of prey item, and everything about them um, helps them to hunt and fly and mate, and that's about it. That's, that's pretty much all, all that drives these birds. Right, uh, yeah, if you didn't know, the peregrine falcon is the fastest animal on the planet, and that has, uh, they've been clocked up to over 250 miles an hour, and they actually have done that with uh, GPS tracking. There's a, there's a development that came out, it's a, it's a small transmitter that uh, mounts on the bird's tail, and it can measure, um, it can track their flight path, it can um, uh, tell you how fast they're going, where they are, and they've tracked, the uh, fastest they've gotten uh, so far was over 250 miles an hour, and uh, it, it, they do it effortlessly. They can, you know, 150 miles an hour is, is uh, third gear to them, and they can just switch between, you know, third gear and top gear at the, you know, just as quick as they want. They have uh, complete control over every feather on their body, and uh, with high-speed photography, uh, sometimes if you're lucky, you'll get a really cool shot of these birds in a dive, and they, they'll be doing something with their feathers that you haven't quite seen before. I saw a picture where um, the bird was in a dive, and its tail was turned completely perpendicular to her body, and that was, that's how they make a high-speed turn. And uh, the G's that they experience in that high speed of a turn would, uh, would pretty much knock you out. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm going to make a quick comment, too, on, on this. Um, when I was a kid in the 60s, 12 years old, loved birds, loved hawks. That bird over there was on its way out. That bird right there was on the endangered list, <coughs> all because of DDT. It thinned out the eggs and the birds couldn't reproduce. I mean, when I was a kid and I saw one of those hawks right there, I got excited. Those birds were darn near extinct. Um, they've come back. We have did something really great there by getting that kind of thing under control. These two birds right here, you'll see them every day. There are, there's probably one of these within two blocks of this place right now. There's a, there's a pair that lives up on City Hall, and they, they, they're they extremely uh, uh, opportunistic. They've learned to hunt pigeons, which is not a normal for a red, red, for a red tail. Red right. But they're really smart, so they've watched these pigeons and watched how they fly, and they've learned how to swoop through them and grab them every once in a while. Right. So one other real neat thing about this kestrel, and this is actually a falcon, uh, they're called sparrowhawks. These birds will 
sustain a hover flight over their prey. So once in a while you'll see a bird out in the field just staying in one spot with its wings, and not all birds of prey will do that. I can't, can't think of another one. A kite will do it. Yeah, some of them can do it in a wind. You know, if it hits the wind just right, they can sit there and hover, but they can do it at will in the air. Right. So, Hey, so this one here has been with me for seven years now, which is kind of a long time for a red tail to live. Most red tails don't live that long, about three years. That little kestrel, about two. Um, in captivity, they've been known to live these birds up to about 35 years. In the wild, of every 500 red tails born like this coming year, only 250 will see their first birthday. And of that 250, only five will see their fifth birthday. So this guy's considered pretty old. That peregrine over there, by the way, these are all our hunting birds. These are not pets, and we do not treat them as such. But you have to have a certain amount of trust and respect between, these, between the birds and yourself for them to do it. Because if we mistreated these birds in any way, shape, or form, they wouldn't hunt for us. They fly away. They fly away. It is their choice when we take them out to hunt to whether they come back to us or not. We fly them free of all kind, all the leather leashes that we have on right now. So it is their choice to come back. And they are totally food motivated. So they come back, our training of them is basically due to food. And they know that we're their best source of food. Because in the wild, they may not eat every day. But they know that when they come back to our fish, that there will be food on that fish for them. And that's why they come back to us. Not because they're like a dog or a cat. And it's not training like a dog or a horse. You can't discipline a bird of prey. You have to have um, a certain amount of sense of humor when you become a falconer because sometimes it all doesn't always go the way you want. It's what we call, it's a suggestion when we ask them to do something and they take it as such. Um, the peregrine falcon, the reason those birds were put on the endangered species list, like he said, was because of DDT and because of other things, shooting and, and other types of things. And the falconers decided that these birds were too amazing. They're too unbelievably fantastic birds to let go. And so the American falconers took their cause and started breeding them and learned how to breed, do artificial insemination and double clutching and decided that if they could breed them in captivity and turn half of them back out into the wild, then maybe they could bring this species back up. And in 1999, they took them off the wild and endangered species list because of falconers that have worked for them. Um, the difference between that red, this red-tailed hawk, who's a male, and that peregrine falcon over there that's a female, other than one is a falcon and one is a hawk, there's different things you can tell. Like he said, her feathers are much stiffer, much stronger, much more able to attain and be able to maneuver at high speeds. This guy here is like the Ford pickup truck. That over there is the Lamborghini. They can both drive them, but you know what? That one does it with a lot more style and class. This guy here, usually around 15, 20 miles an hour. The, that guy, when that girl, when she's out goofing around, is more like 60 to maybe 150 miles an hour just goofing around. When you see one of those in the air, the wings are pointed. When you see this guy in the air, the wings look rounded. Almost like your fingers when you splay them out as far as you can. That's what they're going to look like out in the wild. Um, peregrine falcons, most falcons nest in cliffs, whereas hawks nest in trees. Um, while a bird of prey, like Brian said, we've had red tails figure out how to catch pigeons. Their normal prey is on the ground. Rabbits, snakes. Whereas her normal prey is found in the air. But these birds, if they're hungry, will catch something any way they can. Um, let's see, what else? Does anybody have any questions? Yes? We've seen a number of red tail hawks and they have different colorings. Do the males and females have different the males are most males of any raptor is usually about a third again smaller than the female. So pretty soon you're going to start seeing these birds pairing up because it's getting to be breeding season. So when you see them pairing up and you see a smaller bird with a larger one, the larger one is the female. Um, red tails vary in color anyway from a dark morph to a partial albino. 
and any color in between. So you might be, I know out in Lovelock there's some really dark, dark birds. Out in Smith Valley I've seen some partial albino ones. So they come in a lot of different color variances. It just depends on the genetics. Yes? Um, double clutching is where uh, they've had some really great success at that with the uh, California condor at the San Diego Wild Animal Park. What they did is they got two breeding birds and they have a nest. Now, California condor only has an egg every five years. That makes it kind of difficult to bring them off the endangered species list. So what they did is they put their nest close to a place where they can take the egg. And when the bird isn't looking, they grab the egg. So the bird looks down and says, well, shoot, I thought I laid an egg. She lays another one. They take that one. They take three or four of those eggs, and maybe on the last fifth or sixth bird egg, they let her have it. But they have five viable eggs that they put in incubators. Then they take and they put them in a box with a one-way glass, and they feed these young birds. They pipe in the noises from... Um, a female bird, they feed them with a glove that looks like a California condor. And then when these birds get big enough to where they can start tearing meat apart on their own, and by the way, these are true meat eaters. There's no seeds, there's no fruit, no, 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 no. Straight meat eaters. Um, then they put them in a big pen with other birds just like them. And they become accustomed to seeing that. Because if you imprint it, that basically means that this bird sees me from when it's a baby, it doesn't know it's a bird. It thinks it's a human or it thinks you're a bird. Unfortunately, D'Artagnan was a very young bird when we took him. And so he's an imprint. And every spring, usually I have a female that will come sit next to his pen. And he was, his attitude is, oh my God, get this thing away from me. I'm scared of it. <laughs> it's tried breed, it's tried handing me little toys and stuff because it thinks I'm its mate. And it's scared to death of another female red tail. So he will probably never mate. So most falconers um, either imprint their birds, and it, it, there's good and bad about it. When you imprint a bird, yes, they become a little bit more tame. They become a little bit more dependent on you. But you also have to realize that you can't just let that bird go. You have to try to hack it back to the wild, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. And if it doesn't, then you have to find someone to take your bird if you can no longer have it. You can't just turn it loose. Um, a wild bird might be a little bit harder to train, but they usually know how to hunt better, and they're usually better at it. Because you have to teach this. I had to teach him how to hunt. I believe Brian had a couple that he had to teach, and he used an RC car with a dead say rabbit or quail or something, dragging behind it so that bird could learn that it had to go chase that thing down and kill it. Um, any other questions? Yes? Yes? Yeah, so um, their, their favorite food and the healthiest thing you can feed them is what they would normally eat in the wild, which would be, you know, rabbits, mice, snakes, you know, anything that bird can get its hands on on the ground. And for this bird here, it's mostly uh, feathered, you know, anything, anything that flies. So um, if, if there's some time, I'd like to um, give some examples of, you know, why these birds are so good at what they do. You know some of the examples of their uh, um, how they've evolved. Um, there, if you've ever seen one of these birds, uh, you watched them for a while. They'll kind of they'll kind of bop their head around like this, you know, and, and that means they're interested in something. That means they've uh, they've seen a prey item that they think they can take, and the reason they're moving their head around like that is because they're actually doing trigonometry in their head. They're measuring the position of that animal in space so they know exactly where it is and exactly what they need to do to get to it. And um, their eyeballs allow them to do that. They have, they have uh, binocular vision, which means they can, um, they can kind of zoom in on their prey or anything they're interested in. Any questions?
Uh, in Oregon, I observed the fishing hawk. It okay. builds a nest in the top of a snag. An osprey? The water. Osprey. Yeah. Thank you. I was trying to remember the name. Uh, do, do, are those around here in this area? Are they yeah, they, yeah, they nest up in Lake Tahoe. Yep. There's also a couple breeding pairs in Mason Valley Wildlife Refuge. They put up big stands because they're right here by the first fish hatching. They basically kind of have a sure. buffet right below yeah. them. Yeah. And so they've built these big nests up there and they have like two breeding pairs come back every year to breed. I saw one on Sparks Boulevard one time. <laughs> I've seen on the internet and read articles that you can actually crossbreed falcons into hybrids. Is that true? Yep, that's what a lot of guys are doing nowadays. Um, so there's there's um, breeders that will take a uh, a jeer falcon, which is the largest falcon in the world, and they'll cross them with the peregrine. And the idea there is to get the uh, speed and strength of the jeer falcon and the temperament of the peregrine. So yeah, there there's guys. Breeders are getting kind of crazy nowadays. They're crossing little birds with big birds, and you know, for whatever reason, you know. Okay, we're, we're kind of running behind right now. Um, this, is, this way, it's going to happen. We're going to have the birds in the next room down there. Anytime for the next hour or so, you can come by and take a look at them, get a closer shot, maybe a picture or something like that. Uh, but we're going to need to go ahead and move on to the next speaker, and I'm going to hand it over to Ben. Okay, but come visit the birds in the other room if you're.